Hello, welcome back to theCUBE here at the New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. As we expand our ecosystem, theCUBE is going to be here in New York. More news later in partnership with the NYSE Wired community where the two communities of theCUBE come together and in an open source way. We're so proud of this, of this moment. We're sick to be here. Great team at the NYSE is, of course, with the best guests. Vast co-founder, Renan Halix here. Great to see you, and CEO. Yeah. By the way, congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, great to have you on. I know uh, you just did an interview down there with Trinity with NYSE TV, did the floor. But I want to go deeper. This is, this is about what you guys are doing. The success that you're having in the marketplace is due to a couple of things, in my opinion. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm oversimplifying. But you're usually right. You're in stealth mode. You guys see a market opportunity. You kind of target it. You work with customers and then come out. We launched at the Cube Studios last year. Not a storage company, but as a data platform kind of next gen system. How would you explain what you do and what is the market opportunity? Yeah, we started by building a storage system to address this extreme size of data that's exploding and the, fast, the fact that you need very fast access to it for mm -hmm. GPUs. And what we ended up building is not a storage system, but an operating system. It has the unstructured data piece, it has a structured data piece through the database, it has the compute framework through the data engine, and it's geographically distributed because data should reside where it originates. And so we have all of those parts that end up abstracting away the latest and greatest in hardware technology from these new AI applications. And we're making it easy for enterprises, for clouds, to leverage the benefits of this new era. All right, so who's the biggest participant in, in your, your new journey? Because you guys hit the market perfectly. Who are the early adopters? What's the use case? We have a lot of large language uh, model builders. We have a lot of AI clouds. We have a lot of early AI companies that started with us four and yeah. five years ago, um, like hedge funds and autonomous driving vehicle companies and life science institutes and government agencies. Um, but today, it's moving into the enterprise. Enterprises want to leverage AI, and for that, it needs to be made more accessible to them, and that's what we do. You know, it's interesting, Renan, you know, back when Dave Alon and I started theCUBE, uh, 20, 15 years ago in 2010, um, Hadoop was the big deal. Remember yeah. Hadoop? Oh yeah, big data revolution. Or data's the new oil, everyone talked about. But if you look at who really jumped on that bandwagon and kicked the tires early and jumped in and built those clusters, it was financial services. Yes. FinTech was the early adopter because they already they had a lot of data already. Mm -hmm. They knew the value of the data, it was proprietary then, high frequency trading was a rock and yes. you had data, you had an edge. That's right. Okay, okay, fast forward, Hadoop fails, and then another generation has blossomed out of that manure that the failure decomposes and the new flowers come up, which is data brick snowflake. Yes. Okay, great. Data clouds which is basically data warehouse in the clouds. Okay, great, they continue to go along, but now, Gen AI comes, which is a horizontally scalable construct that has to generate an answer, like, like it's a runtime. That's right. Okay, so you say, okay, what does that do to the data model? So, there's a real discussion going on in the data world where it isn't yes, your grandfather's data warehouse, it's not your yesterday's analytics team, although they are data scientists, this is a DevOps, this is a cloud engineering assignment. That's right. To refactor everything. And you're seeing the evidence, open data tables and formats, the catalog and, and governance unwinding, intelligent data apps, in massive demand, developers on the sidelines waiting to chew up those models and put them into the applications. Yes. This is the market right now. Do you it agree is. with that? I do. I think we're moving from what you said, the old world of batch processing and of numbers and rows and columns of a database to natural information, to pictures and video and sound, and that requires a very different type of infrastructure in order to support it. Not only that, within the world of Gen AI, we're starting to see that training is different than inference, and now they're starting to come together through these feedback loops, yeah. and inference is different than your old operational enterprise systems, but they're starting to come together through RAG, and so you yeah. need a system that is very versatile, yeah. that can do very large clusters on the one hand, but 100% resilient and up for real time and production applications on the other. You know what's interesting is that when I talk to folks and what you're kind of laying out is a lot of technical architecture. Architecture, which by the way, is different but super relevant now and, it, and, and, and that's why you're doing so well. This idea that it's horizontally scalable, data needs to be free, low latency, yes, accessible. Not like seconds, milliseconds. That's right. Okay, so so okay, you say okay, this is, this is going to 
probably the next generation. But when you actually think about it, the infrastructure is not yet up to snuff. That's right. So this kind of data layer is out there. So you got three layers, physical, infrastructure, data layer, middleware, whatever you want to call it, and then applications. What's going on in the infrastructure? Because you're playing very well there now in the infrastructure yes. with storage and global namespaces. And the data layer one is ready to get flipped upside down. Yes. And you would agree with that. So where's the action going on in the enterprise? I mean, infrastructure. So the underlying hardware that we get to use today is what allows us to build this stuff. It's what allowed us eight years ago to build this new architecture. The DPUs are now allowing us to build a new type of data center and to run our software in ways that weren't possible before. Uh, the GPUs that we're leveraging for our database abilities and to um, find similarity across data uh, sets, all of that could not be done without the underlying infrastructure layer. A lot of it is coming from companies like NVIDIA uh, that are obviously innovating and advancing the, the status uh, of the state of the art. And we're trying as much as we can to make it easy for yeah. everybody to use without yeah. being a PhD in computer science. And I think what you guys do with the data layer is that you're not a data layer per se, but you're at the more of the hardware data layer, almost the abstraction interface to what will become maybe a control plane data yes. layer. So I want to ask you, and you brought up this earlier with your top customers, today I can see the training guys loving you because unstructured data and semi-structured, all those data lakes, I mean, they're a dream scenario for them. Yes. Um, so you already talked about that, but but here's what, here's what I see, and they're not mutually exclusive. Training is hot now, and it's never going to go away. It's like it's like school. I go to school. I go to I mean, go through grade school yes. and then go to college, and I don't stay in school forever. Of I course. use my training to, to infer, infer. <laughs> and like make it. I might take some classes on the side, some side training that reinforces learning. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the progression. How do you explain that? Because I think training doesn't necessarily go away, but there's a lot of heavy lifting when you need something new. So yes. if I go back from my master's degree. Okay, that's two years of heavy training. I think it's going to become much more iterative in the process in the same way that we learn and apply, learn and apply. We don't necessarily do it in batch. The computers will do the same. And what you mentioned with reinforced learning and the feedback loops that are starting, I give the analogy of when Google started, they built their PageRank algorithm based on static information, how many links were pointing to a yep. page. Then they realized human interaction could help them rank pages yep. better. What do people click on? The same is happening now with AI. We're moving from static training to real-time training with feedback loops. And that is colliding those two worlds that today are very different one from the other, and it's forcing one infrastructure underneath. So obviously, inference becomes the killer app surge, which you mentioned earlier, RAG, Retrieve Augmentation Generation, the hottest app now is never going to go away. That's the killer app. People still yes. need to find stuff, whether you're a machine looking for it That's or right. a human. Explain the dynamic. This is not a one-trick pony. It's no. fundamental. So RAG makes it such that you want access and fast access to all of your organizational data such that you can use your data um, as part of these AI workflows rather than just what the uh, model trained on. And what we're seeing now is agents starting to form. Like you said, whether it's a human or a computer, the agents are now starting to talk to each other. You no longer need formal APIs between computers for them to cooperate, and new um, abilities are emerging through that. You know, I mentioned this earlier about how FinTech adopted data early because they were already in that data business. Cool, I get that, but one thing I want to reference to that was is that they got the value of data. Now the enterprises are waking up and saying, I see the value of data. Not that they didn't before, but they just couldn't do anything about it. That's right. They saw they had data, but it was too much of a hassle, the heavy lifting. Yes. I mean, there was no such thing as re-architecting your data layer. Enterprise search was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Now enterprise search is a dream yes. scenario. Talk, talk about why this is a new opportunity. It's like, finally, the moment where enterprises could leverage their value of their data. Talk about yes, that. Yes, it's a big treasure chest and it's full of data that's accumulated over the last 20 years because everybody knew that they should save it and now we finally have the key that opens that chest and unlocks the value of all of that information. And the organizations, the enterprises that will leverage that will continue and the ones that won't will die out. So they have data models, like if it's structured data, so it was all legacy formats. Yes. So talk about why your vision of VAST will unlock that because with AI, that can just really be abstracted away and yes. learned. That's right. And then freed up, so explain that power dynamic, because this you changes the game. don't need people to manipulate the data, to catalog the data, to understand what's in it, then you just 
learn it, as you said. And what we built is the ability to bridge the gap between unstructured data, pictures and video and sound and giving it structure such that you can ask intelligent questions yeah. about it through our database. And again, making yeah. it very, very easy for organizations that don't have that expertise. So I noticed you guys have a, your customer base is on the large side, on the AI side, all the top players are using you guys, the scale and quantity, so congratulations, you got the, you got the whales, <laughs> whale hunting. Um, but in the enterprise, as they become the whales of the enterprise, they have to rethink how they architect their IT globally. Yes. Okay, for a generation or two. So we're seeing for the first time in my life, I've never seen this before, since the mainframe went away and then distributed computing kicked in, yes. where they're actually rethinking their entire plan. The foundation of their data estate, infrastructure estate, because NVIDIA and clustered systems are coming out, because things like storage is rethought, reimagined, mm -hmm. and the data needs to be available everywhere, yes. they have to redo everything. That's right. We're in a redo. What's your advice to people who are looking at that problem? It's coming down from the top and then it lands in the smartest people in the organization and they got to put a plan together and architect that system. What's your advice? So it depends on which layer of the stack you want to start in. If you want to go all the way down, then you need to build new data centers with more power and a denser power, and then you need to fill them up with new types of hardware. It's no longer x86 pizza boxes that are filling up the data center. And then you need a software infrastructure layer on top that supports that level of scale and performance. And then you need to start building your applications. Most of the customers that we work with don't go all the way down. They leverage one of these new AI clouds, for example. Um, that have done all of that. Uh, for the first time, the big clouds are being disrupted by this new architecture, and so we're seeing companies like CoreWeave and Lambda and G42 rise up and service uh, enterprises in a way that the big clouds don't yet, and our data space, our global namespace, allows you to also maintain all of these different silos, if you will, and stitch them together into one platform. So you're enabling the little guy, so to speak, in this case, because of the clouds, become a big cloud. Yes. Specialty cloud. That's right. Explain what specialty cloud means, because we all know AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. What is, you mentioned Core Weave, Lambda, and yes. the GPU Cloud, but why why is that working? And and what's the reason? Economics, is it specialty, specialism? What is the reason? I think it, it's what we just said. They're building from the ground up, and they're not uh, encumbered by the legacy that the big clouds have built over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, these new guys have 200 kilowatts in a rack. They're full of GPU servers and super fast networking and JBOFs that are connected through NVMe over fabrics. They are built for this era of large scale high yeah. performance and they leverage our software stack in order to provide yeah. all of the cloud services that customers expect. I mean, you're obviously technical co-founder, vast, regional revolutionary approach, you know, unique approach. Are you surprised, what's the, most, what's the most compelling thing about this wave? Is it the fact that things like NVLink exist and that the, now the, the what was once a server, okay, pizza box or even a for you, like whatever, is so powerful? Yes. What, is, what, what gets you, what do you point to say, wow, this, was, this is the game changer? What would you point out? If you I had think, the, yeah, it's the ability to get these neural nets to start delivering value. And when I was in school, uh, the joke was that nobody understands how they work and they don't do anything useful. Um, <laughs> Two problems. <laughs> yes, and it, it's the same exact neural nets with slight modifications, but it's a lot more data and a lot faster access. And that architecture, that distributed architecture is what allowed us to achieve that. Okay, target. since you're the expert, define neural network for, for our audience. What is the neural network? Is it just a bunch of vector embeds? Is it math? Is it the glue tissue? What is a neural network? Yeah, it's a way to build software based on uh, examples rather than based on code. And so we build, we try to mimic the human brain even though we don't really understand it. And we, and we give a lot of examples and play with weights and uh, balances across uh, artificial neurons such that that thing, when you give it a new thing that it wasn't trained on, it can sort of recognize or understand what is in there. Um, I think the interesting idea here is that we truly don't understand how the human brain works, yeah. and yet we're able to at least at some level do something similar. What's the mechanism behind the neural network? You guys write your own code using knowledge graphs? Is it math that with embedding? What we is don't use neural networks within our product. We just enable that application by providing 
extreme access to very, very large amounts of information. So I take all of our transfers from the QVs, they're all in, in vector embeds. Is that a yes. neural network? I think so. Yeah, okay, we're good. We have retrieval. Yeah. We can match, I think, I think that's the game changer. I think neural networks, graph structures work well, you mentioned weights, that's, that's right. a node in an arc, it's just autonomous theory. I mean, this is old computer science stuff, yes. right? I mean, so this is, I mean, this is, a, this is why I see a throwback. I want to get your reaction to this before I talk about culture. We're seeing a systems revolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, this is what I see. Do you agree, and if so, how would you describe this next generation system revolution? Is it new class of kernel developers? Is it machine coding? Is it new software? Do you agree, and then what's your definition of systems revolution? I think it's a new architecture, and the architecture that we've built on the software side, what we call disaggregated shared everything, we're seeing that mimicked on the hardware side. Uh, we mentioned that before around having GPUs with fast networking and dumb JBuffs connected, no longer a lot of x86 servers, no longer shared nothing architectures. Everything is becoming disaggregated. Everything has access to everything. It's a many-to-many -many connection with super fast networks within a data center and relatively very fast networks across data centers. And that is enabling a new way of building infrastructure that we couldn't do before. Two final questions. One is on the product-led growth. You guys call yourself vast data. Vastronauts. We do. You know, like rocket ship. You know, the key to rocket ship is one, not to blow up and don't fall off of yes. it, right? So, <laughs> how do you keep the competitive strategy going? What is the product strategy? What's your plan to maintain competitive? And are the hyperscalers your friend or foes? I mean, what's your go to market? Tell us your advantages. So, the way that we work is we listen to our customers. We choose our customers well in the sense that we like to collaborate with forward thinking organizations. Uh, before AI was a thing, a lot of our customers were doing AI. Today, it's the large language builders, it's the AI clouds. Whoever's at the forefront, we like to work with, and then they tell us what to build. Yeah. And then we build for them, and yeah. two years, three years down the road, everybody else wants that system, that product as well. And so we leverage our customers as So our design partners, managers. basically. That's exactly right. You work with them. Well, I think you guys did a great job on that. And one thing we didn't get to, we don't have enough time, we'll have to get to it later, is the edge, because as devices get smaller, you need to have inference and, and some reinforced learning at the edge, which yes. is going to be more, more compute, all of the discussion. We'll do that another time. But I want to do a wrap up with you and talk about culture. Yes. Every company's got a unique kind of cadence. Intel's was Moore's Law, doubling every few years, you know. Every company has that unique thing that's either from the founders. Yeah. What is the culture of Vast? What is the, what's, I mean, I, I have my opinion, but I want to hear it from you. Yeah, we love uh, big challenges. We love, uh, as the name suggests, everything is space themed. We love this <laughs> idea of very, very large space and, and it starts with data, but it, it comes back to our culture. We want to do the impossible and we love setting those impossible targets yeah. and then as a team achieving those targets and not letting anything get in our way. There's no organizational structure that gets in our way. There's no politics that get in our way. It's a joint mission, and whatever it takes, we do in order to achieve so that. So very mission-oriented, mission goal-oriented. Anything that blocks that gets pushed to the side. That's exactly right. And how does that work with, with people? A lot, is it the Amazon debate in the line? What's, the, what's the, uh, the person, the power dynamics inside the company? You need a certain type of person that likes that challenge. It's a lot of type A personalities. Um, and then they like to work with each other because they realize that it's too big for them to do on their own. Yeah. Uh, my job, as you said, is to set that target and then to remove obstacles from yeah. people's way because they know how to do it much better than yeah. I do. And so whoever's the expert in a certain field, that's who we listen to. Yeah. And if there's a disagreement, then we go back to first principles and understand how does it need to be, what works, what doesn't work, and very soon we align on what we need to do. Great, great, great conversation. Quick, quick final, final question, future priorities for you. Yeah. What, what's, your main, what's your main focus, you personally? I want to make sure that we don't screw it up. Um, I think you mentioned we've been very lucky. Uh, I didn't say you're lucky, I said you're good. Well, I yeah. think we're very lucky to be in, in the place that we are, where we've built a product that solves a big problem that's getting bigger and bigger, um, we could do it because of these new underlying technologies. Um, there's a surprising lack of competition yeah. considering how big this uh, market is going to be. And so we just need to make sure that we don't screw it up. Yeah. And every morning that's what, that's what drives well, us. Well, good. Congratulations. We'll continue to follow what you're working on. I don't believe in luck, first of all. I think you make your own luck. I think the universe has a master plan. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. This is our inaugural 
broadcast. We're flying solo here in the NYSE. You're part of history. I'm glad to be here. Okay, Thank ready. You Thanks for going on. I'm John Furrier here with the Cube on the show floor at the New York Stock Exchange. Live coverage from the Cube action here. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.